Yeah, when I was asked to come up with a title for this talk, we were in this pattern of about every season there was another major crisis and blow up in CT. And so I figured there'd just be a whole bunch of stuff to talk about by now. And uh, so this is good news, bad news. There hasn't been. So that's kind of good news, but it can also put me on the spot a little bit. There was uh, one notable perception. Uh, another CT perfusion incident came to light just in March. So I'm going to hit this again. Uh, we are not under control yet. We had some overexposures in Cedar sinai in October of 2009, and very quickly after that, something uh, emerged in Huntsville, Alabama, and we thought everybody got the message and went and looked and took care of their protocols, but very recently, another batch of these uh, has emerged. So what, as far as I can tell, and this is a lot of this news is sort of physicist grapevine scuttlebutt, but, um, okay, so C2 perfusion, for those of you who don't do this very often, uh, it sounds kind of strange. What we're doing with C2 perfusion is actually examining the motion of blood through a specific slab of tissue. This is most often used for stroke, sometimes used for tumor activity. We do this with lots of rotations of the x-ray tube and little or no table motion. And so a small amount of tissue winds up getting a relatively large amount of radiation. So what you wind up doing in the clinic is first uh, a quick scan to identify the, the part of the body that you need to look at, and then you park the patient there and start up the scanner. And there needs to be several rotations without anything happening, and then the IV contrast is administered, and we watch it actually accumulate, flow in, flow out, and then stop. So this goes on anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds, and sometimes there are additional later um, images that are taken as well. So this is a little movie loop just to give you an idea of how this really happens if you've never watched one. I have three regions of interest shown here, one in the aorta, that's green, and two in the liver. They initially don't look like they're in different places, but you'll see that they actually are. Oops. Okay. There we go. And you can see that the blood flow into the aorta is very quick, turns white right away. The CT numbers shoot up over time and then back down. And that these two regions in the liver, one is over a tumor and the other is over normal tissue. And these trace very different temporal signatures in the images. And this is what gets shoved into some very robust mathematics. And the result is a bunch of color maps. So this is one of those few areas in radiology where having a color monitor is actually a requirement. This particular case was uh, from my institution where we do this for tumors and not for stroke. But you can see over this nine months period how the blood flow map changed in this particular liver tumor over time. It initially was very hot, meaning high blood flow, and that's what happens with growing tumors. They need to generate blood to grow and, and get their stuff going. Eventually, the treatment causes it to sort of cave in in the middle. This is tumor necrosis. And after nine months, metabolically, it looks the same as background. Now, structurally, it's probably still there. But from a functional standpoint, it has been killed, basically. So that's the idea with C2 perfusion. It's more commonly used in stroke. Uh, I pray that I never have a stroke at my uh, place of work or break my arm or do any of those normal things because uh, our emergency room is totally not geared up for normal stuff. We, we just do cancer. But this is how uh, someone with a stroke in a certain part of their brain looks after CT perfusion. And there, this exam tends to be very... Uh, temporally important. There's a, there's a time window where once you get this information, you can make appropriate treatment decisions. If you wait too long, your treatment options kind of go away. And so the ability to do this study and do it really quickly is really important in those centers that offer this. So what happened at Cedars-Sinai and these other places? Uh, at Cedars, apparently 
the CT protocol settings for that exam were changed, and as far as I heard, nobody has confessed to making those changes. And then they got copied around, so all of the GE scanners they used um, were changed. For some reason, that's still not clear. Tube current modulation was enabled, which is an odd thing to do for that exam. And as just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, the KVP was increased to 120 down from what we tend to use at 80. And that is going to make a huge effect on dose just making that KVP change. The noise index was set. We're not sure if this was a default thing. Some people are claiming this, this once they went to tube current modulation, the default settings came up um, and that they were very ridiculous, and that could very well be. The numbers that I've been hearing sort of tossed around were like at the minimum level that the scanner actually allows. A tube current modulation, for those of you who aren't real familiar with it, has really two or three big advantages. It right-sizes the technique to the size of the patient. It takes into account the shape of the, the cross-section so that if you're very oblong, it will increase the MA through the oblong parts and lay off through the skinny parts. And it also will change the technique as you move down the Z-axis so that if you're doing say head and neck, you can lay off scrawny necks like mine or beef up for football player no-neck types. Well, if you think about what's going on here, this is one slab in a head. Okay, most heads are about the same size. They're mostly pretty round, and they don't change their shape in this one or two slabs worth of geography. So the, the choice to use this dose reduction tool which seems like a good idea, uh, in this particular setting was very flawed. It didn't play to the strengths of this particular option at all. And, in fact, I think it got them into serious trouble. Now, part of what I think was going on was uh, an educational or training mess. Um, if you reduce the noise index in this particular setting, you're reducing the noise in the imaging, in the image, which is going to cause a big increase in dose. So I, it seems from the, from the outside looking in, what may have happened was, oh, we want to use dose reduction, and we're going to make this number tiny for tiny dose. And turns out that both of those options were, uh, both those decisions were not the best way to go. So what can the rest of us learn from this? Well, clearly we need to get our, uh, we need to stick our noses in here. We need to, Get nosy and get in people's faces and look and see what is going on with these CT perfusion exams. That was uh, one of the first things. I think this came to light when we were at RSNA. And first thing I did when I got home was check our CT perfusion protocols to be sure that we weren't going to be the next set of headlines. Well, if you haven't done that yet, run home and do that tomorrow or the next day or as soon as you show up back at your place. The other thing that we really all need to be paying more attention to is periodic reviews. That change happened without somebody who knew what was going on really being involved, being was uh, clearly not in the loop there. And I think as physicists, we need to be in that loop, and we need to take a much more active role in regularly looking at these protocols. This is something that the that my state, the state of Texas, is uh, now recommending on a monthly basis that the lead techs look over all the protocol parameters on all the protocols that are actively used. It also, um, I think, increases, at least I feel the pressure, to do a little better job of documenting changes. Um, and we've had, we're constantly changing protocols at my place. We've got well over 200 protocols and in any given week, we're messing with dozen or two dozen of them. Yeah. And it, get, it gets to be really hard, and, and things kind of get away from you really easily. And it can be hard later on, you know, a couple weeks later, remembering what change you intended to make, what was really made, and why did we do that again? And so I think we're all going to have to start figuring out how to document some of this stuff so that we can actually trace back and figure out how we got to this place we're at now. So you're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, I can look them over, but what am I going to compare them to? I mean, I 
don't necessarily know what's a reasonable set of protocol parameters and what's unreasonable. Well, lucky for you, the APM Working Group on Standardization of CT Nomenclature and Protocols, uh, this was Cynthia and I are trying to head this up. This group has kind of two charges. Uh, the second charge is really about terminology, but the, the first charge is to develop some consensus pro protocols for those sort of uh, top ten type of studies that we do just for this purpose, just to give people a place to go and look and compare and see what they're doing compared to somebody else's uh, that has been vetted. The membership includes both uh, academic and consultant physicists, folks from the ACR, the ASRT, the FDA, and all of the big five now manufacturers, plus MEDA. Now, the MEDA membership has just recently changed, and I don't have the new person's name because uh, I didn't have time to dig through my emails, but uh, there is a different person on board now. So what we do is look at them. We all discuss them, sometimes to great length, and then uh, we do, actually they come from the manufacturers. So the manufacturers sort of give us what they would consider their standard default settings, and we all look them over, make sure they, they sort of make sense. One of the, uh, this is what the website looks like. You must be an AAPM member right now to access it. We're working very hard to make this open to everyone, so uh, because there's been a lot of complaint about that. But this is the idea. We sort of give some indications, some diagnostic task elements, and uh, a bunch of sort of general knowledge about what the particular exam is intended to do, some example images, if that makes sense, and then every vendor is allowed to put up that's a little bit loose, but I think we were aiming at four scanner models per vendor. Some of them, we've gone a little more than that. Some of the vendors have chosen to use fewer, but every model uses the terminology that's actually on the scanner so that it should be very easy to go in, look this over, compare it to your own scanner, and tell whether or not you're kind of in the right ballpark. That's the idea. These are meant to be reasonable, not necessarily optimal or the perfect ones, but just reasonable alternatives for comparison. Right now, the CT uh, neuroperfusion protocols are up there and available. We're working through the rest of what we consider the sort of bread and butter CT exams that are shown here, and uh, they're getting, a couple of them are getting pretty close as well. We were also asked to help with the CT dose check feature. This is another hot topic. Newer scanners are being developed, de being delivered with a new feature on it called CT dose check. This was really, I think, pushed by the FDA. The FDA wanted the manufacturers to do something to stop these uh, overexposure accidents. There are two levels of dose checking. One is an alert, which really looks through the entire exam and says, you're really up there in terms of dose, and the, the sort of nominal limit right now seems to be one gray. So if you've gotten up to that limit, it's going to flash and bells will ring and everybody will stare, and uh, you have to do something to, to uh, continue. The note, uh, this is CTDI vol, so I think. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the notification is more on a per beam on uh, basis. And here, so this is more of an exam specific limitation. And this one, it's going to be a lot harder to set. We came up with some sort of default values to just to give them something to roll out with. Uh, but savvy sites are going to need to adjust that. And it's going to be a hard one to figure out. Because if it's too high, it will never be tripped, triggered, and it will never function as a safety measure. If it's too low, they'll hit it for every other exam, and they'll start ignoring it, and it won't serve any purpose there either. So this is uh, something where it's going to take a little time, I think, to converge on reasonable notification levels. But what happens, and these are some, um, some of the pages that the different vendors have developed for this, but as far as I can tell, you will have a choice. The technologist can either back up, change the dose parameters, and move forward again, 
Or if they feel that it's really necessary for this particular exam to use the parameters that they've selected, they will need to override it with either a password or their initials or something that provides an audit trail so that we could, say, on a monthly or a quarterly basis, go back and see who's been overriding this and on what kind of exams. So the last part of my... Uh, yes. Eventually it will be retrofitted, but they're having, uh, I think, enough of a challenge of getting it on the new ones that it will probably be a year, maybe two, before we start seeing it pop up on some of the older ones. Okay, so this, what I'm going to show you next is uh, pieces of a talk that John Boone gave a couple weeks ago in Brazil, and this is all about right-sizing the dose value that's reported for specific patient sizes. He did a nice job of reviewing what it is that we're actually doing when we measure dose. This is, to me, one of the biggest challenges in, in the clinic once we started to look at these patient dose reports was to explain to the radiologists this is not patient dose. Even though it says that, even though you imply that, this is dose to a phantom, a plastic thing that's only this big or this big, and that's it. There's two sizes. And that's really difficult for them to uh, get, a gri get a grip on because our patients come in all sizes, uh, from the tiniest tots to, um, you know, tiny older women and, and, and folks who can't, uh, who really stretch the limits of our CT tables. And, you know, there are, are patients who you wish you could sort of soap up so they sort of slide through a little bit easier. Um, so they, we, and at a cancer center, I kind of expected everybody to be thin and emaciated. Well, that's not true. Very often they kind of bloat up. They, they change their shape very quickly during treatment, very often, uh, in a, in a measurable way and in a way that the two current modulation actually recognizes and change, changes. So this, the data that, uh, were used for this particular test group report were obtained from four independent research groups who were really looking at this problem from slightly different perspectives. Tom Toth and Keith Strauss looked at CTDI vol values with three specific size CTDI phantoms. So they were saying, you know, what happens if we do this? We change the dose. We change the phantom size. So they developed a bunch and a bunch of data from that. Cynthia McCullough and her Mayo team uh, developed these torso phantoms. These were meant to look like abdomens of lots of different size and shapes. And they also looked at what's the CTDI, CTDI vol associated with scanning all of these things, particularly if we use sort of a static technique. What differences in reported dose do you see? And you would imagine you would see a big range. From the uh, computer modeling side, Mike McNick Gray has uh, looked at many voxelized patient models from the tiny tots to the largest um, voxelized patient models that are available and looked really at different dose values and metrics associated with patient size as well. And John Boone and his team used Monte Carlo modeling to uh, sort of extend that work but more modeled uh, the CTDI phantom type style of uh, dosimeter. And what was phenomenal, and I, and I don't know if John found this accidentally or exactly how this came about, but he wound up tossing all this data together, and it all fell in line. Even though it was from four different groups, really looking at it from four different perspectives, when you look at dose versus size, and that's kind of how I think of this. It says conversion factor, but I'm thinking relative dose along the y-axis and patient size along the x-axis using a standard, say, 200 MAS technique. This is what you would expect to see, that the smaller patients get way high dose, the really big patients get way low dose, and we have this nice continuum of data. This is relative to the 32-centimeter phantom, and you can see that there's uh, there's some spread at the very small end, but where the adults live, this is uh, amazingly tight. If we look at the 16-centimeter phantom, 
There's still a little bit of spread way down at the tiny end, but it's very, very tight. So it looks like, and these, this was done with different scanners, different beam widths, different KVPs. I mean, about everything you could think of to screw this up, it didn't screw it up. And so this is very, very solid data. So how do we, how are we going to use that? Well, we have to come up with some size metrics that we can actually use in the clinic. And uh, the report includes several options here. One is an AP and lateral um, dimension of the patient to try and put that into effective diameter type um, units, which you can do if you have both dimensions. And if you do two scouts on a patient, you can get both dimensions. If you do the lateral and then the AP or in whatever order you want, you can pick these right off the scout. Sometimes you can pull them off the image, the axial image, but it that sort of assumes that you can see the skin line all the way around, and sometimes you can't. So how would you actually implement this? Well, we would look, for example, at this particular little tiny tat and draw a line across. It's probably as wide a spot that's going to be scanned. This particular one looks to be about 15 centimeters, and then we would look at our 15 centimeter lateral dimension line. If I can get this thing working. And that would tell us both the, his effective diameter, which we're not totally keen on, but what we really want to know is the correction factor to use for the proper CTDI vol phantom size. So the phantom size that's reported is one of the key pieces here. And I think most of the dose reports that I've seen lately have been very clear about that. We're either using the 32 or the 16. And so you look, you see, you pick off your CTDI vol value, you see which phantom was being used. This particular interface is just showing that we've got the CTDI vol shown. So you could actually do this ahead of time if you wanted, prospectively as opposed to what most of us are unfortunately doing now, which is prospective analysis. If you uh, don't get them off the scout and you have to do this after the fact, you can pull them off the images. Again, as long as you can see the skin line. This particular case, we're looking at the lateral and the AP dimensions here, totaling up to 22 centimeters. And the dose value that was reported for this particular uh, patient was 5.4 milligray, but that was on the 32 centimeter phantom. So... We pick off our numbers on the chart, and this particular chart was for the 32-centimeter phantom. There's another set of charts for the 16-centimeter phantom, and you get that correction factor, and you, do, you compute something called the size-specific dose estimate. So this metric and the name of this metric was also um, discussed pretty heavily. So you will likely be seeing this brand-new abbreviation showing up, in the next year or so, the SSTE, which is Size Specific Dose Estimate. So this is a new CTDI vol value that is now sized for that particular patient as if we had used a matching CTDI vol phantom. Okay? So that gives us basically a new CTDI vol. This particular case, it jumped up from 5.4 to 13.5. So this is what the table looks like for the 16 centimeter, uh, CTDI phantom. And it's a little bit bigger, longer for the 32 centimeter CTDI phantom. Alright, so what do you do with this? Well, it's a size corrected CTDI vol. One thing you do not want to do is go applying your K factors willy nilly to this number. Those K factors were all based on standard man size stuff, and it's going to take us a little bit of time and effort to actually figure out what to do with these K-factors when our, our CTDI balls are now kind of all over the place. Actually, what we should see is that our CTDI balls will converge. Now, the, the folks who don't understand CT very well have been complaining for some time that if, if you look at the, um, the CTDI vol values, done on abdomens, they're all over the place. They're, you know, factors of two and three different. Well, you know, they ought to be. If you're, if you're size correcting your protocol correctly and your patient sizes are all over the place, if you're using a single phantom size, your CTDI balls 
darn well need to be all over the place. But what this will allow us to do, I'm hoping, is to kind of bring that in, to see if we've actually size corrected our techniques appropriately for these different patient sizes. Um, I'm thinking now when I get home, in addition to rechecking our CT perfusion protocols, I'm going to um, try it out, see see if you uh, apply some of these correction factors to some real patient data, the small ones and the big ones, and see how those numbers change. They should start kind of falling together. I'm sort of predicting, in general, the pediatric numbers may still wind up being a little higher than the adults. I think we might need more image quality there, but in my particular um, institution, the pediatric radiologist lives with a lot more noise than our adult radiologists do. So it may actually be opposite in my particular place. But it'll be interesting to look at that kind of thing. That's what this tool will allow us to do. Uh, it may give us some data that's kind of similar to average organ dose, which would be interesting. A liver, for example, liver is pretty big. It takes up a big part of that image. Uh, the size corrected CT dival may give us a fairly good estimate of organ dose for, for the liver, for example. That was really all I had on what's hot, except for this last um, very self-serving <laughs> slide. Uh, Cynthia and I are recreating our CT dose summit. We did one of these in Atlanta last year, and um, we had to limit, we had to cap the size because we weren't sure how many people were actually going to show up. And it sold out in less than a week. So clearly a lot of folks are still real interested in this. So we're going to redo it. It will be held in Denver in October. Uh, the plan is for about half of the program to be completely new and different and for the other half to be updated. So if you were lucky enough to be part of that first group of 200, don't think you know it all. Uh, things have changed even in just a year, and there will be uh, new stuff going on. We're going to try and, on the second day, break things out so that the techs, the physicists, and the physicians I'll hear information that's a little more specific to their particular fields. And that's all I have. That's that's a really good comment, and I hadn't really thought about that. When trying to do a dose estimate, usually the average is what we want, and so I was always happy to get the average as opposed to having to sit through and average 300 numbers or something like that. But, I, yeah, I can see your point. Um, if you were doing a head and neck, the thyroid would be in this, hopefully the scrawny neck and get less dose but on some people, it could be in the no-neck area and get quite a bit more, and you wouldn't necessarily get very much of a feel for that from one number. That's very true. Um, something else you may, may or may not be aware of, not all of the vendors actually do the averaging thing when they report the numbers. I think Toshiba actually reports a maximum CTDI vol, which is a little scary. They are trying to be conservative, but um, I think they're gonna, they may need to kind of rethink that. But that's a, a very good uh, point that we'll, we will definitely have to think about more.